right, good morning. I'm Madonna, I'm one of the second years. I'm gonna to talk today about a topic that we don't see very frequently, but it's a good topic to prepare for when the patient comes in. And that's anterior TMJ dislocations and how we reduce them. So specifically, I'll be talking about the anatomy of the joint, the pathophysiology of how uh, the joint becomes dislocated, how we reduce it and what to do after we reduce it. And that man in the corner there is Hippocrates. And he actually first described the technique for reduction that we still use today. And special thanks to Drs. Chu, Kopchuk, and Turner for feedback on that lecture. So to start with the anatomy of the joint, the TMJ joint is a very unique joint because it's both a pivot joint and a hinge joint. So it kind of moves in two different directions. Um, the normal joint is an articulation between the condyle of the mandible, as well as the glenoid fossa of the zygomatic arch of the temporal bone. Um, it's a bilateral joint. If you look, you can see the um, actual anatomy of the condyle itself. It's important to know like the shape of the condyle. It's not flat, it's actually pretty wide. And it's good to keep this in mind when you're actually reducing the joint, just to think about how the parts are moving around each other. And then also take note of the coronoid process because this comes into play with certain reduction techniques. This is just a zoom in of the actual bones of the joint. Um, notably, the condyle is held in place anteriorly by the articular eminence of the uh, zygomatic bone. And there's an articular disc between the two. But of course, there's more than just the bones. So there's a bunch of muscles as well, all the muscles of mastication, including the master muscle, the pterygoids, um, the temporalis muscle. These are all innervated by the trigeminal nerve. And there's a bunch of ligaments that also hold the joint in place. So on the left side of the slide, this is the normal closed uh, TMJ anatomy where the condyle is held perfectly in place within the glenoid fossa. Um, when the mouth opens, normally the condyle moves a little inferiorly and a little anteriorly. And pathologically, on the right side of the slide, um, you'll see the condyle is actually anterior to the articular eminence itself. And at this point, the muscles are spasming and the ligaments get really stretched and this prevents proper closure of the mouth. Um, dislocations can be bilateral or unilateral, acute, chronic, recurrent, partial, or complete. Um, I'll be focusing more on anterior dislocations, but it's also important to know that there can be posterior, superior, lateral, or medial dislocations, all of which are associated with traumatic mechanisms and more likely to be associated with mandibular fractures. So how do we actually dislocate a TMG joint? So anything within the anatomy that I mentioned, the nerves, the muscles, the bones, the ligaments. So muscle spasms, um, ligament laxity, any anatomy issues with the bone itself. So either the condyle being too flat or the articular eminence being too flat. And you can imagine that if uh, somebody has a bony abnormality of the condyle, they're more likely to have recurrent dislocations. Um, of course, traumatic mechanisms. Um, when what we see in the ED more commonly will be over-functioning of the jaw. So when somebody's yawning really wide or if they're opening their mouth really wide for a dental procedure, um, seizures, tetanus, dystonic reactions, and we can actually iatrogenically cause them with uh, intubations. And then patients who have Marfan syndrome and Ehlers-Danlos are more likely to have dislocations just because of their underlying connective tissue disorder. So this is really a clinical diagnosis. When these patients come in, you'll pretty clearly know that they have a TMJ dislocation, um, but on exam, they'll be unable to close the mouth They'll have drooling, their speech sounds garbled. When you look inside the mouth, the oropharynx itself should appear normal. Um, the patient on the left of the side has a unilateral dislocation. So the chin will deviate to the opposite side of the dislocation. So this patient, the, the dislocation is actually on the right side, the chin is pointing to the left side. And then the patient on the right side of the slide has a bilateral dislocation. Um, when you palpate the patient's face, the TMJ area, you'll feel a depression underneath there, and you can actually palpate the coronoid process, just like floating underneath the maxilla. Um, generally, you don't need x-rays or CTs unless there's a traumatic mechanism and you're concerned for an underlying fracture. Um, more specifically, with superior dislocations, you always need to think about mandibular fossa fractures, and with superior, sorry, with posterior dislocations, think about external auditory canal fractures. Um, in these cases, you'll probably also want to get a CT head and C-spine. Um, differentials to think about when patients come in looking like this are anything that involves the oropharynx or the neck, so things like a PTA, a retropharyngeal abscess, or epiglottitis. Um, however, these patients always look much sicker, they're febrile, and usually they're complaining of neck or throat pain rather than pain around the ear. 
So how do we actually reduce these dislocations? So just to preface, there's no preferred method of reduction. I'll talk about four different techniques, but this syringe method that I'll mention, I would recommend starting with first because it's the least invasive method. And even if it's unsuccessful, it starts to fatigue the muscles and may help you eventually reduce the dislocation. So with this method, you're gonna give the patient either a five ml syringe or 10 ml syringe, any syringe that engages both the upper and lower teeth. And you're gonna have the patient try to roll the syringe forward and backward with their jaw. So you can instruct the patient to try to bite their teeth together, to try to push their chin forward. And if it uh, is successful, it'll move the condyle posterior to the articular eminence and back into place. If the dislocation is bilateral, this generally reduces both sides at the same time. The benefits of this method, um, this doesn't require sedation and generally doesn't require IV analgesia as we'll see with other techniques. Um, other techniques are more invasive. And there was one study that showed it successfully reduced 30 out of 31 patients. And of those patients, 77% were reduced in under one minute and nobody required sedation or IV analgesia. So again, this is a good method to try for the first attempt of reduction. The intraoral method is probably the method we most commonly think of. This is also, also the method that was described by Hippocrates. Um, this will require sedation and analgesia because it's a very uh, painful and anxiety provoking procedure. Um, out of all the articles I read, Versed is recommended for sedation because it's also a muscle relaxant as opposed to like propofol or ketamine or other sedating agents. Um, in patients who have a lot of comorbidities that you're more worried about using sedation with, you can consider regulotemporal nerve blocks or deep temporal nerve blocks or even infiltration of the TMJ space with lidocaine. So for this meth method, you're gonna have the patient sitting upright. You're actually gonna put your thumbs inside the patient's mouth. So you wanna protect your thumbs by wrapping gauze or curlex or even putting tongue depressors on the surfaces of your thumbs. So you're gonna place your thumbs on the occlusive surfaces of the lower molars and you're gonna wrap your fingers around underneath the patient's jaw. Um, and you're gonna start by pushing inferiorly and then posteriorly and superiorly. It's helpful to have another person hold the patient's head still or to massage the master muscles. And you can imagine that once you do get a successful reduction, you have to be careful because the jaw is gonna rapidly and suddenly close um, and the patient can bite down on your fingers. Um, and again, if the, if the dislocation is bilateral, this typically reduces both sides. The next method is the risk pivot method. Um, just anecdotally, a lot of people have told me this is the most successful technique. So in this technique, again, you're gonna be putting your fingers in the patient's mouth, but instead of your thumbs, it's gonna be your index fingers. So you're gonna place your thumbs underneath the chin and you're gonna put your index fingers either on the bottom teeth or next to them on the gums. So at the same time as applying upward pressure with the thumbs, you're gonna apply downward pressure with your index fingers. You're actually just gonna pivot your wrist forward. So instead of applying like forceful pressure, you're just pivoting the wrist. And this typically reduces both sides if it's bilateral dislocation. Um, the extra oral method is the last one I'll talk about. This is the least invasive method and it's the most helpful for a dislocation that's unilateral because it reduces one side at a time. So you're gonna have the patient either sitting upright or supine and on the affected or dislocated side, you're gonna put your thumb over the coronoid process and your fingers on the mastoid process. On the opposite and normal non-dislocated side, you're gonna put your thumb on the anterior maxilla and your fingers um, like behind the angle of the mandible. Essentially what you're trying to do is rotate the jaw back into place. So you're gonna apply like posterior pressure on the dislocated side and try to you know, pull anteriorly on the non-dislocated side to rotate it into place. Um, so I'll show you a video so just of note, in this video, the provider tries to uh, reduce the left side first and then reduces the right side. And as she's reducing the right side, the left side re-dislocates and then she reduces the left side again. So she's reducing the left side and now she's reducing the right side. And then she's reducing the left side. And then you can see it pops back into place. <laughs> okay. Um, so when you want to call OMFS for help, um, so anytime there's a complication associated with the dislocation, uh, meaning there's an associated fracture, um, if you've failed at reducing after multiple attempts, if there's associated cranial nerve deficits, 
um, if it's not just an anterior dislocation, if it's superior, posterior, or lateral, because there's usually other uh, like fractures associated with it. And you can consider it in patients who have recurrent dislocations or it's a chronic dislocation, um, generally because these patients benefit more from surgery than from just manual reduction. Um, and what would OMFS do for these patients? They may reduce under general anesthesia. They may inject botulinum toxin into the muscles. Um, I've read they also can inject blood within the TMJ space to induce scarring and fibrosis to prevent the condyle from moving. And they can even perform surgery and alter the articular eminence to prevent the condyle from becoming locked into place. Um, so complications associated with reduction. Um, generally, it's pretty well tolerated. Very, very rarely would you cause a mandibular fracture yourself. Um, very rarely would you posteriorly dislocate the TMJ where the condyle protrudes into the external auditory canal or a superior dislocation where the condyle protrudes into the basilar aspect of the skull. Um, but more commonly, you can cause facial injuries, inner ear injuries. And of course, with the um, techniques where it involves the provider placing their fingers inside the patient's mouth, there's always a risk of body fluid exposure and lacerations to the provider. So what do you tell your patient after you successfully reduced the TMJ dislocation? You tell them to avoid extreme opening of the jaw. So you can suggest that when they're yawning that they support their lower jaw with their hand. Um, they should be eating soft foods to avoid any gummy foods, gum, or really tough foods. Um, to use NSAIDs for pain control and warm compresses and to follow up with OMFS in two or three days. And this is my mom's dog about to dislocate her TMJ. <laughs> uh, any questions? <clears throat> yes, Dr. Slender. Probably the most important thing that I think we mentioned is uh, stabilize their head. When you do sitting up, they're going to have their head against the wall in a chair or against the back of the bed. Because as soon as you go to push down, their head's going to pull away and it's going to move backwards when you push against it. You have to have something behind the back of their posture. So they don't move away from you. So if they can move, you're not gonna have any force on the mandible. You're gonna have all the edges to move away. Mm -hmm. uh, I've tried the, the syringe technique probably eight or ten times now. I've never had it work once, but maybe others have other experience with it. I think I think it's just nice theoretical about never seen it work. But I I think Jimmy said he's seen it work before. I just never I've never had it work. <clears throat> the one where you put your thumbs inside. It's really important that you get your fingers under the mental prominence, and as you're pulling backwards on the teeth, the mental prominence goes up, so you're rotating the jaw and pushing it back. And then you just rotate and push backwards with your head against the wall or your head against the bed, and that usually works for me. But I, I've had my ex wife is all my best, so we've had many conversations about this. And the ones that we always fail and like call all my for, they kind of just give me some pain medicine and they just push harder than you do. I think that you just don't. Set them up correctly with their head against something, and they don't we don't push harder than you. That's usually been all my best experience and why we failed the treatment. For those of you at home, Dr. Silverberg was emphasizing the importance of making sure something is behind the patient's head so that when you're using force to push the TMJ back in place, that their head isn't moving. So. Any other questions? Did you see anything about the tongue depressor method? Um, like avoid it, like a. You just keep stabbing. You keep stabbing the tongue depressors between each other, and they figure they're. It's good to stretch them out beforehand. Sometimes it works well. That's a good. Another one to look out. It's also kind of one that you can put put them in and walk away from the patient and kind of keep going. So if you're in like a busy community place where you don't have time to kind of sit and think. Dr. Willis is saying you can also uh, do tongue depressor stacking to try to open up the jaw as well. Um.